because um, John and I go way back. Uh, we have a wonderful speaker today, uh, John Young, but I'm going to let Kaz do the formal, you know, Department of Education, um, you know, uh, welcome, because this is a grand, grand Rounds, which is focused on education. But I want to give a personal uh, note of introduction, which is um, we met when I was an assistant professor at UCSF, and John was a resident. Um, and he was already, you know, obviously stood out in terms of his um, both clinical enthusiasm and his really thoughtful way of thinking about the learner experience. And we shortly after that had a chance to work together on a initiative that our chair had put into place, which was to rethink the curriculum for the residency, particularly with a focus on um, bringing in uh, more of the developments that were occurring in neuroscience into the curriculum and weaving it throughout the four years, and just thinking how could uh, a, a newer curriculum be re-envisioned. And we just had a ton of fun working together. It was um, to have someone so innovative and enthusiastic um, who was speaking from the learner perspective, but could also pan back and think about the field changes, you know, um, creating new ways of learning important new material. Um, it just ended up being a very kind of um, kind of productive, I would say. Um, I mean, the product that we actually came up was very very useful to the department, and actually ended up in some uh, being implemented in some in some new ways. So. You know, I have a lot of affection for, for John on a personal level, and to have seen his um, career go in the direction of actually thinking about um, applying uh, research and methodological rigor to the learning experience um, in psychiatry, and then to see him now in this vice chair position rethinking and redoing a, a residency program and other learning experiences um, uh, has just been a real kind of pleasure for me. But personal note over, and now to his uh, long list of accomplishments. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here. I'm Kaz Nelson, Vice Chair for Education in the Department of Psychiatry, and it's my extreme pleasure to be introducing Dr. Young today. I know Dr. Young from our work together on a, on a national council for the Associate, uh, American Association of Directors of Psychiatry Residency Training, ADPERT, where we served uh, on the Executive Council together for uh, many, uh, four, four or five years together. And so um, I've been consistently impressed with him as a person and, and his professional career and really um, uh, look to him and his, uh, the path he's paving in education research. A little bit more about Dr. Young. He oversees education for the Department of Psychiatry at the Zucker School of Medicine and the Zucker Hillside Hospital, which is uh, also responsible for Dr. Beiser's training, so we're, we're <laughs> grateful for that connection. Uh, he also directs the Psychiatry Residency Training Program at Zucker Hillside and chairs the Curriculum Committee, which oversees the four-year curriculum at the School of Medicine. He received his BA, magna cum laude, from Harvard University with a double concentration in social studies and the comparative study of religion. He earned a master's degree in public policy from the UC Berkeley Goldman School of Public Policy and a PhD in health professional education from the er Utrecht University in the Netherlands. He obtained his MD from the University of California San Francisco School of Medicine where he also completed residency training in general adult psychiatry. And prior to his career in medicine, he did human rights work in Southern Africa and Asia and served as legislative director for an assemblywoman in the California State Legislature, where he helped lead several important health policy initiatives. So, so all of that's his training, and uh, with that training, he's uh, held a number of esteemed leadership positions and conducted a significant amount of education research um, focused on the intersection of medical education, patient, patient safety and quality improvement, and performance assessment. And in particular, he's been a national leader in handoffs, education, and research, cognitive load theory, the July effect, and competency-based assessment with uh, publications in the top journals of the field. And, um, you know, as, as funding becomes more of an issue for research, and particularly education research, for which there's uh, significantly fewer grant mechanisms, um, he is one of the leaders in uh, obtaining grant funding for educational research with over $200,000 right now supporting his initiatives from um, the American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology. So, uh, you know, um, it just doesn't get much better than that. And so we're delighted to hear from you today. Thank you.
I'm definitely blushing. Uh, very excited to be here. Um, as you heard, I'm a former resident of Sophia's, and um, uh, she's really been an inspiring role model for me as a leader, researcher, educator, and somehow does it all. Um, and uh, it's really great to, to be here and see her and her new digs, um, Minnesota, Minneapolis. All right, so um, uh, I'm also had the chance of spending some time with, uh, with the education team here so far and just really impressed by um, your, your leadership, Kaz and uh, uh, Laura and John. Uh, and then, of course, Mate, former resident who seems to be blossoming here. So uh, you always, your former residents, you always uh, feel a, a, a loyalty and kind of a parental responsibility for, and it's, uh, it, it's really good to see um, him here and how well things are going. Okay, so um, I wish I had more disclosures. Uh, here you go. Um, uh, I'm gonna, I want to talk about, and I, I definitely have um, two topics I want to explore. One is reimagining GME in light of uh, failures in our healthcare and med ed systems. And then the second is future directions and competency-based assessment. Um, I'm going to um, move through the first part fairly rapidly, but I think it's an important uh, framework uh, to situate the conversation around assessment. So in the last four years, uh, five years, we've had a number of reports from different bodies, IOM, uh, regulators like the ACGME, stakeholders like the AAMC, um, the Lancet Commission, the Carnegie Foundation, et cetera, all coming to similar conclusion that there are critical deficits in our medical education programs and that our graduates um, leaving our programs are not prepared to practice in the emerging uh, care delivery models. And I, I want to uh, bring that conversation to the broader failure that's really driving all of this, which is the concerns about our healthcare system overall. Um, this is a, a value matrix that plots uh, performance against spending, uh, you know, and ideally where we want to be is in the upper left-hand quadrant, right, so high performance, low spend. You can see where uh, 10 comparator countries are, um, all with kind of similar uh, spend, but quite a bit of variability in performance. Um, where you don't want to be is in the lower right-hand quadrant, right, because that's, that's high spend, low performance, and that's where we sit uh, as a country. Um, and you see this... Uh, you know, in all sorts of different metrics. We have the highest uh, healthcare amenable mortality rate among the 11 countries. We have the highest uh, rate of death due to mental illness and substance use. We have the highest rate of medical errors. Um, we spend two to three times more per capita uh, than other countries. So this has, um, you know, raised a lot of concerns around how can we better align our healthcare system with the health needs of our patients and communities, and so this idea of population health. And that's really what has led to the scrutiny of medical education programs as a key driver, not the only driver. There's a lot of things feeding into the healthcare system and determining ultimately health outcomes, but our medical education um, system is, is an important driver of quality. So I see this as being the... the, the having kind of three types of misalignment between the medical education programs and health system. There's the, the misalignment about the what, so the competencies that, that are learned and taught. There's a misalignment around pedagogy, so how the instructional techniques that we use, and then around purpose and meaning. I'm going to run through each of these um, uh, fairly rapidly, but to set the stage for uh, competency-based assessment. So we have this paradigm shift going on in healthcare from uh, a system that's historically been focused on the episodic management of acute illness by siloed expert physicians, uh, depending a lot on the hospital, and really focus one patient at a time. And, you know, what's emerging is uh, the idea of population health with a much more of a focus on the longitudinal management of chronic illness delivered by teams. And so, in a way that the, the patient-physician relationship in some ways is being expanded into a patient-team relationship, uh, delivered primarily in ambulatory settings with, with a focus on, on both the individual patient but also the health of the community. And so this requires um, 
a whole new set of competencies around uh, team-based care, knowledge management, uh, care coordination, patient-centered communication, uh, data-driven QI. And yet these are areas that you know, study after study shows that our graduates have deficits. Um, yeah, anywhere from, say, that our uh, competencies with shared decision-making with patients to uh, clinical reasoning and kind of the scourge of diagnostic errors that are becoming more and more appreciated and um, exist and account for uh, a, 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 a significant proportion of error-related deaths in the U.S. as well as adverse effects. Um, and, and also deficits in patient safety, measurement-based care, um, et cetera. So all of this then leads to um, the recommendations of, hey, we're going about developing our curriculum wrong. We need to start with what are the needs of the population and the health system, define the competencies that are required um, to uh, function and, and deliver value in that setting, and then devise a curriculum to support that. And this is really quite different from um, how uh, curriculum has been developed in the past, which has been more in a, in a silo. I sit on the review committee for psychiatry for the ACGME, the RRC, and we're about to do a focused revision of the program requirements. And I'm struck that really the only organization that we're going to consult early, early on are the program directors. So the program directors are really important. I'm one, Kaz, one. We have obviously an important stakeholder, but really shouldn't the, the, the it start with the conversation with the uh, um, health system and pr perspective and patient perspectives. How are we doing? How are psychiatrists um, performing right now? So this is a shift I think we need to make in kind of both at the local level as well as national. So if you think about it, all right, then we let's define the psychiatrist of the future. And that's, of course, uh, a little hazardous, but has something to do with chronic disease, um, something to do with really uh, looking at uh, population health and primary prevention using technology like telepsychiatry and two-way texting and panel management um, and uh, functioning in integrated systems. And if that's what we're trying to get at, then we need to re-image our clinical curriculum. And so there's a lot of obvious implications. Um, one is moving uh, training from often predominantly inpatient intensivist settings to ambulatory, like the medicine and neurology training, um, and, and probably moving medicine so that ideally it occurs not just in the first year, but that would require um, regulatory changes. But if you see psychiatry as a, as a specialty of medicine and if the uh, embedding of behavioral health and medicine is such a critical mandate, um, we probably want to see medicine training um, more longitudinal. Emergency psychiatry, rather than that being part the sort of the domain of the ED as a setting, really thinking about how do we train to manage those uh, Ur urgencies and urgencies in urgent care clinics, hotlines, et cetera. Telepsychiatry um, has a set of competencies associated with it, uh, and this is going to become uh, a, a, just a, a real prominent feature, I think, for most psychiatrists. In the last 15 years, our VA and some other systems that are more population-oriented have been real leaders in this, but you're seeing now um, all healthcare systems looking at Right now, you know, using teleconsults and kind of telepsychiatry for emergencies, but um, moving where we need to get to is really for routine ambulatory care. Similarly, uh, consult liaison has traditionally been all about the hospital, and and this is probably one of the most important areas that we can add value to the healthcare system is how do we um, embed and manage behavioral health issues that present in primary care and different kinds of medical settings. And uh, integrated care models have emerged. Collaborative care is one of them. And this is really needs to become, I think, the central part of CL training uh, it, down the road, is we need to figure out um, not to eliminate the hospital experience, but really incorporate the ambulatory experience in a robust way and, and move this out of the classroom into um, really the core cr clinical curriculum. Other implications, uh, which in some ways Minnesota, I don't know real well, but um, you know, like California has, has a, a history of more managed care and lower lengths of stay and kind of some more systems approaches. But, you know, big picture, um, the learning about acute psychiatric illness traditionally has been an inpatient where there's long lengths of stay and has really facilitated um, terrific um, 
context in which to, to follow patients for several weeks or months. But as lengths of stay really come down, and uh, when I was at UCSF, I watched it come down from a couple weeks to less than three days, um, acute illness is, is, is managed more and more in partials and IOPs. And again, this is an area where there, there probably will need to be some regulatory relief because right now the RC requires six months of inpatient. But if the goal is learning the acute management of illness, you're probably going to want to have our residents in, um, in these other settings. In terms of chronic disease, it's always been an important part of psychiatry, um, but it really needs to become the backbone bone where uh, it's team-based, uh, where there's you're learning panel management skills and, and ideally starting intern year. Uh, uh, but that too would require uh, some, some regulatory relief, but certainly second year. And around that, really, you know, these skills that are so critical to uh, uh, chronic disease, uh, shared decision-making, motivational interviewing, we should be the experts at this. And, our, both, uh, and our, our, our residents and graduates should be extremely skilled at being able to um, transfer these skills to different settings. And um, often in, in programs, you learn motivational interviewing in the, in the context of addiction, but it never gets really transferred into routine med management in the ambulatory setting or, or other contexts. And so you can check it off. Yes, we taught it, but it hasn't really been learned in a way that it's infusing practice across contexts. Okay, and then of course we need um, what I call pulse policy leadership systems engineering. A um, lot of cool developments around how do you create experiential opportunities for residents to learn safe patient safety and QI. Um, there's a, a model patient safety uh, rotation that is published in academic medicine last summer and has been featured by the AAMC that um, uh, two-week experience where residents learn by doing an actual root cause for the hospital and doing work that would otherwise need to be done. Um, and it has had really good outcomes associated with it. Okay, now we get to pedagogy. So second misalignment. Um, and... Uh, Sophia will recognize the, the, the book on the right, which is by uh, Dave Irby and Molly Cook and Bridget O'Brien at UCSF. It's the Carnegie uh, Report published in 2010 on the 100th anniversary of the Flexner Report, which was 1910 and um, was the, really the prevailing paradigm for medical education for the last 100 years. Um, and these reports, in addition to the IOM and Lancet Commission, have all concluded that we basically rely on non-evidence-based ineffective instructional techniques. Um, now here, uh, with your team and, and Bob Englander and stuff, you're probably very aware of kind of the, but we tend to re rely on SAGE on the stage, kind of doing what I'm doing today, which is a lot of slides and a lot of information transfer that's passive and doesn't work. Um, and in the clinical environments, we tend to, uh, uh, either have students passively observing or we send residents off to do a lot of care without being observed and coached enough. Um, and all of this means that uh, using sort of these ineffective uh, pedagogies means that training's inefficient. It's probably longer than it needs to be. But more importantly and more concerning is it's ineffective. So that even if we're teaching the right content, it's not getting learned. It's not getting transferred to the workplace. And uh, part of that is that Given the way medical education is structured, it really does teach um, kind of more a passive approach, and, our, and our, our residents aren't graduating with the skills to regulate their growth and change practice as the evidence changes. And this is partly why uh, physician practices really don't change much after training. It's sort of, and it's very, it takes a long time uh, for new evidence once it's been definitively established to actually be adopted. And uh, interesting, some recent studies show that it takes even longer for us to de-adopt practices that are no longer supported. And that may actually be one of the um, most uh, important challenges for us to get our, our heads around. So this then says, okay, let's re- Let's go back to science and redesign medical education with, um, with what we know from, about how people learn. And um, this is a, a slide that sort of captures the different learning frameworks. On the, on the far left are cognitive and behavioral approaches that focus on skill acquisition and use techniques like activating prior knowledge, um, making sure that we're integrating 
foundational science with experiential knowledge and using scaffolds, deliberate practice. On the far right, you've got more sociocultural perspectives, which have really emerged in the last 10 years, and looking at how does learning occur in the workplace. And, um, and it turns out that you know, some of the really important features of that is having a, a clinic or a team that's welcoming to learners, that identifies clear role for them, and has affordances or supports and scaffolds in place to help them move from the periphery to the center of the team with, uh, with authentic responsibility. And, they, and these mo kind of frameworks really emphasize the importance of role modeling um, and the climate, as well as uh, attending to sort of motivation and self-directed learning. Now, this is a study that I use a lot for my thinking because um, we know that spacing or practice is really key to, to, to learning. Um, and, but not all practice is equal. So a lot of medical education tends to be in blocks and kind of that binge purge, you know, and doing inpatient this month and CL the next. But we know that people learn better when it's, when it's um, spaced. Uh, so a half day or a day a week for six months or a year is going to be better than a, 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 a full time for a month. And yet um, the learners... Uh, perception, which is on the left, they perceive that they learn better in the block uh, uh, frame, whereas when you actually measure performance and learning, it's it's 80% are doing better in the interleaved or spaced. So this is one, I think, training directors and, and associate deans of curriculum come up against this because learners and often faculty are really tied to the block approach um, and are convinced that it's better. Uh, and yet, the, the evidence is absolutely uh, clear that it's not the case. So one uh, learning framework that, that really uh, applies to GME is what's called deliberate practice. And this comes out of the study of how novices become experts. And, um, and I won't spend much time on this, but just to say, it, 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 when you look at that process, there's a lot of practice. There's a lot of direct observation. Um, and uh, there's a lot of feedback and coaching because it, it turns out that we are not very good at self-assessment um, and um, we need real help in sort of interpreting data and making change in a way that's both supportive but accountable. You think about uh, how many folks learned a musical instrument growing up and Anyone, and kids, how many folks have kids now taking lessons? Fewer. Um, imagine if you, you know, if you took your kid to a lesson and the teacher, piano teacher said, okay, sit down, I want you to practice the four or five pieces that I gave you last week, and then went into the, another room and practiced their piano in parallel. And then comes back 20 minutes later and says, hey, Naomi, it's my daughter, um, who's taking piano, uh, how'd you do? What are you doing well? What do you need to work on? Okay, why don't you work on that? And then went back to their, their, the other room and practiced their piano in parallel, right? We wouldn't pay for that. And yet that's really how we, we traditionally have trained doctors. And you think about, uh, we were rarely uh, uh, observed with intensive coaching, uh, and we really don't know what we're, what we're graduating at the end. All right, and then the third area of misalignment um, is purpose, meaning, and there's something, and, and you have a, a, a very strong leader in CAS uh, on this, there's something fundamentally wrong about our medical education programs. When you think that matriculating students have higher uh, indices of well-being, they're more idealistic, they're more empathic than their um, age-similar graduates, but within the first year it all changes. and. Uh, burnout increases, the curves flip, and it continues through residency into early practice. And now I'm sure you know, you've, you've heard a lot of discussion. A lot of this data has come out of Mayo. 40 to 60 percent of physicians are experience burnout. And we know that you know, not only is there the human cost there for the physicians, but we know that that leads to higher errors, lower quality, higher turnover, uh, et cetera. A lot of efforts now, and how do we then help trainees become more resilient? And how do we address the environment that drives burnout? Uh, and things like RVU systems and uh, 
how do we modify those so they account for mission aligned but non billable activity that's an important part of meaning and work um, but is getting squeezed out as the as RVUs become more intense or the EMR which in many contexts has turned physicians into glorified data entry clerks and is a huge uh, dissatisfier and um, you know technically uh, can it's not a technical issue in terms of you can make interfaces that are seamless and work um, as a matter of kind of will and, and resources. But other than the, the, those two frameworks, my own set feeling is we got to come back to calling and that if, in helping learners to discover, you know, where is the passion of their heart overlap a need in the world and go deep and go after that. If you look at physicians who spend 20% of their week doing something they're passionate about, they're much lower probability of burnout. So I, I think, you know, from a curriculum standpoint, and um, lots of programs are starting to do this with tracks and other mechanisms. I know you have here um, such an approach. Um, what we're doing is we have uh, what we call pathways expertise, intern supply, Second year gets a month to do a lit review and come up with a project proposal, a study or an innovation. And then third and fourth year have a half day to a day a week in a mentored way to implement, evaluate, and then publish or disseminate. And this has just been incredibly um, successful for us. And 70% of our residents are participating, and they are leaving with both an emerging expertise but some self-efficacy and a sense of, um, of like purpose. That's really cool to see. We're about, we're just finishing a qualitative study where we're using um, a social cognitive career development theory to, and we're in, interviewing graduates who've been in this program and not and looking at sort of how it's impacted their, their career development. Okay, so that's, um, that's the first part of the talk. And this is, um, uh, you know, about these three misalignments, and if we can, you know, we need to address all three, and if we can do that, I think there's hope that we can both improve alignment, but, but also really result in um, physicians who are going to be lifelong learners and, and more competent. We transition to the second part. Um, so there's a catch in all of this, uh, and the catch is that None of this is likely to really work unless we develop a robust system of assessment that has two parts to it. One is promoting, driving, self-regulated learning. So um, uh, formation, the sort of assessment for learning, uh, feedback and coaching so that um, learners graduate as self-regulated and they can then change as the evidence and context changes, which does not exist right now. And the second piece is an assessment system that uh, both promotes competency, but also in a way that um, is determined in a trustworthy process that has validity. And that's critical because um, otherwise we're not going to ever know if someone's ready for practice. And we're not going to be able to rapidly identify folks who are off trajectory. We'll never be able to move to time variable training if we don't have, if we don't have this. Um, and thirdly, you know, the, th the third reason for all of this, um, and these are the two aspects. But if we're um, if we don't have meaningful educational outcome measures, we're not going to know which of our strategies work and which doesn't. And we're not going to be able to drive continuous improvement. So um, a lot of uh, focus on now in the last 10 years and thinking about assessment in a different way. So it used to be that we really got focused on the psychometric properties of the instrument that you use to assess. And a lot of my research has been in that area, and I'll present some of it in a moment. Um, but turns out that validity doesn't reside in the instrument, but in how the instrument's used and how the data is interpreted and applied. So a lot of the thinking internationally has been that you need to get validity, you need to have a, a program or system of assessment that has a number of uh, components. Um, there's work-based assessment, which we'll talk a bit about in a moment. So moving from measures of knowledge to actually what, do, what does the learner do with patients in the workplace. Faculty development, how to directly observe, um, how to give feedback. And then dashboards, which you have here, I believe, in UME, at least for the EPAC program, that 
uh, capture, aggregate, and visualize performance data for each learner or resident that then a, a longitudinal coach can use with that learner to um, identify areas for improvement and drive cycles of change. Dashboard also would be used by the Clinical Competency Committee to be trained in how to use that data to more rapidly identify folks who need help early on and to know when someone's ready to launch. I'm going to talk um, now about just two parts of this uh, framework. One is choosing your assessment framework, and then the second is work-based assessment. Um, and uh, we'll leave the, uh, well, I'll say a few things about the other parts at the end, but uh, leave that for another day. Um, okay, so first thing you got to do is you got to choose your assessment framework. And um, just like there's been this paradigm shift from acute management of acute illness to chronic disease and population health uh, in healthcare, there's also been a huge paradigm shift in medical education, um, which has been from a focus on process based education where uh, Training is fixed in duration. We infer competence if you've done X months of this, Y months of that. Focus on knowledge acquisition rather than how it's applied uh, in, in the workplace. Norm referencing, which means our assessment traditionally has been how does the resident or learner compare to peers? Are they top 10% average versus criterion reference, which is assessing against uh, sort of the objective competencies that are deemed uh, necessary for a given task. And in the past, much more focused on summative assessment and not as much on formative or the assessment for learning. This has been nothing short, really, of a, of a revolution for those of us in education because it's in a completely different um, focus from it used to be that, you know, when we're getting a site visit, we're checking off all the things we teach. Uh, and now it's really not about what we teach, but it's about what's learned. And um, I just find this incredibly exciting because it changes the conversation in, at all levels. And it also raises the, the possibility of, of where time is no longer constant and a proxy for competence, but is a resource to drive uh, acquisition. So here's our framework, right? Um, six core competency domains, which was adopted by the ACGME in 99 and implemented in 2001. Uh, similar frameworks in other parts of the world, CanMeds, uh, uh, UK, Europe, Australia, New Zealand, all working with uh, similar kind of outcome frameworks. Here, um, in 2014, we implemented Milestones, which was an effort to try and make the competencies um, more specific and workable. This is a, a picture of what CAS has to do uh, every six months for every resident um, is fill out this on every single sub-competency. So you can see in the upper left, PBLI is the domain, practice-based learning and improvement. Teaching is a sub-competency. There are two threads, A and B, and then outlined in red are the milestones for, that, for thread A. We've got uh, 22 sub-competencies, 66 threads, and several hundred milestones. So this has been an effort to really work to the right. We're starting with the domains, trying to make them more specific by splitting into the kind of the com component knowledge, skills, attitudes. But this um, has met with a lot of challenges in implementing. Uh, I'll just show you a few, a few headlines. Uh, here that some of you might identify with. Um, and a lot, a lot of challenges with um, this idea that they're too, simultaneously too abstract, but also like too many of them to pay attention to simultaneously. So they're sort of too granular. And you just, when you're observing someone in clinic, you can't pay attention to 22 uh, 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 sub-competencies or milestones. So this um, has led to a lot of, a lot of dissatisfaction with, with this framework, and partly also the validity evidence hasn't been that great. And that's where 
um, we come into this whole shift uh, to the left, which is, okay, let's see if we can kind of move from this reductionist approach to a more holistic or synthetic approach. So what are the key activities that a psychiatrist does in the workplace? And maybe we ought to make that the focus of, of assessment. And this is what an EPA is, an entrustable professional activity. Um, it is a, it's a unit of activity that, um, that's discrete, that a real doctor does in the workplace, and something that can be entrusted to someone once they are uh, ready to go. And when, if you define the EPAs for a specialty, together they should capture the essence of that profession. Um, it doesn't capture everything, but it should capture um, a large part of what really defines that specialty. EPAs have um, really taken off internationally as, as in a framework. Lots of specialties have, have uh, adopted them, particularly medicine, peds, OB, anesthesia, um, and psychiatry were, um, were often the, the last to join uh, this sort of thing, and we're just now kind of entering into EPA frameworks. And these are some examples of EPAs um, from other specialties. Uh, you can see you know, manage high-risk childbirth from OB or manage a psychiatric emergency from psychiatry. So you can see these are much more synthetic or, or holistic. So milestones are, um, you know, more person descriptors, EPAs work descriptors. Milestones are really a, uh, an ex exercise in deconstruction and splitting, which can be very helpful in certain contexts. Uh, EPAs are much more holistic and and the unit of observation is the, the core activity. Um, so this is where, um, and in general, it's not an either or, partly because in the U.S. we're required to do milestones and EPAs are optional. So if you're going to go to EPAs, you still got to do milestones. So we tend to think about these as complementary frameworks where uh, you can have EPAs as your assessment framework, but you're mapping back to the, the, to the relevant competencies and, and milestones. In EPAs, you have a different kind of scale. So rather than, you know, uh, does not meet expectations, does above expectations, or meets the competency threshold, exceeds, it's all about level of supervision. Uh, so you're, you're asking, you know, based on this observation or these series of data points, how much supervision do I think this trainee needs? Um, this is, in GME, would be a typical scale that's used. And the initial evidence or some of the early returns have been very encouraging in terms of entrustment as a construct, assessment construct. Um, this is a study from anesthesia that showed comparing to uh, the mini CEX with the traditional competency, nine point competency scale uh, compared to the supervision scale. You can see that the variance um, is much better at discriminating between trainees. Um, it reduced disagreement between raters and you needed far fewer uh, observations in order to get to some kind of generalizability threshold. And you have ad hoc and you have summative uh, entrustment. And uh, the ad hoc is what we do every day in clinic, you know, how much autonomy we're going to give the resident. Uh, and then the summative is when you're ready to launch uh, to a new less supervision or independence. So I'm going to tell you a little bit now so about psychiatry. So you have this EPA um, framework that's uh, emerged, and we now have our first set of proposed EPAs for end of training. And this comes from work that um, I chaired in ADPERT, which had, it was, had a task force, which was charged with, please develop EPAs for psychiatry. So being dutiful folks, we did that, um, six of us, um, and Cat Catlin Hasser, Eric Hung, who Sophia knows from UCSF, were involved in this. Uh, Colin Stewart from Georgetown, Andrea Weiss from Einstein, and Nancy Williams from Iowa. And we set out with, we wanted EPAs that were essential, clear, and representative of the specialty. And we have, uh, took a four-phase process of this. So in the first phase, uh, the six of us met for 90 minutes, once a month for a year. Reviewed the literature, looked at other specialties, other countries, and then we each generated our own list, and then we went through an iterative process of kind of winnowing down. And we started with around, actually, it's about 75 EPAs, and we got to 52 pretty rapidly. And then at the end of this, we had 24 proposed EPAs. 
In the second phase, we consulted with non-psychiatrist experts. So this is part of our methodology. The first step is pretty typical. This step is fairly unique and has, um, it, and has is something that a lot of other specialties and countries are now doing, is we went to people outside of psychiatry who are experts in EPAs, and we said, look at this list. Tell us what you see. Are, are they clear? Do they make sense? Are they kind of the right type of scope? Um, and we got terrific feedback because uh, they were able to identify some of the blind spots and assumptions in, in our thinking uh, uh, that we had. That got us to 14 EPAs, um, and we wrote out then title, description for each one, all the competencies that are required for the activity, and we cross-referenced to milestones. The third phase was the National Delphi Survey, and this is also, I think, a, a strength methodologically, where we, we identified 31 experts. Uh, they were, we defined them as members of the Executive Council of ADPERT, which is the Program Directors Association, and the members of the original Psychiatry Milestones Work Group. We developed a video and a two-page article that we had every respondent expert um, watch and read to make sure that we all had a shared mental model about what an EPA is. Great response rate. And um, we did two rounds of survey. Um, our, our respondents are uh, very experienced. You can see uh, about 23 years of practice on average, 50% from the Northeast, otherwise distributed across the country, and a lot of local and national leadership. This is the type of profile for each EPA that the first survey round generated. So we had you know, the, how they scored in terms of essentialness, clarity, scope. And we had comments for each of these categories. Then we revised the EPAs based on this data and then resurveyed. And in the end, we had 13 proposed EPAs. Um, and you can see them here. I think they're readable. Uh, you know, manage psychiatric patients longitudinally, which includes panel management, uh, manage psychiatric emergencies, a diagnostic evaluation, manage psychiatric conditions with medications, et cetera. A couple comments about these. We purposefully did not split by disorder. So some specialties had create different EPAs. Let's say number four, manage psychiatric conditions with medications. They might have a different one for bipolar, for schizophrenia. Um, also, some, some contexts have, have done it by medication class. So in New Zealand, uh, they have an EPA just on the use of clozapine, which is interesting. Um, we also didn't uh, split by patient complexity. So internal medicine has EPAs for sort of the simple presentation and the complex, but you could do that. Um, and, you know, in fact, there's uh, lots of different ways that uh, uh, you can go with this. What we laid out are these 13 really proposed EPAs for experimentation at the local level. Um, a couple of uh, just high points from this. Um, I think our, our methodology for, for this space was very strong, particularly the, the non-specialty experts in Delphi um, and the frame of reference training. Uh, we had very stringent inclusion criteria, which I won't go into today, but used something called the asymmetric confidence interval, which uh, we were really excited about, but this is pretty technical. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, you see these lump split decisions that programs uh, we identify and really encourage programs to, to experiment with. Okay, so if you have EPAs as your framework that are cross-referenced to milestones, the last part of my talk is about creating a technology-enabled work-based assessment program. Uh, so this is, you know, starting with Miller's Pyramid. <coughs> Um, in medical education, we have traditionally focused on the no knowledge with MCQs or uh, OSCEs to figure out if a student or resident can demonstrate a certain skill. But as we, we really focus on preparedness for practice and wanting to have valid uh, assessment, it, the emphasis has changed to the does. So what does the learner actually do with patients in the workplace? And so this is led to the emergence of a, a whole field of assessment called Workplace-Based Assessment, or WBA. Um, again, this remember now our, our kind of pedagogy of choice for today, for this talk, is deliberate practice. And um, 
And uh, the importance of sort of redesigning, first as a starting place, you have to redesign our clinical training experiences so that there's a lot of observation occurring and feedback, and that there's a lot of challenges to that, but that's one of the big hurdles facing uh, GME. Um, we know a lot about feedback that, you know, part of why you're doing direct observation and work-based assessment is you want to generate feedback that enhances learning. But not all feedback is equal um, or helpful. Um, we've learned quite a bit. It needs to be soon after the observation, it needs to be behaviorally specific. Um, you want it to include self-assessment. Two things that have really emerged lately are, or three things, is there needs to be an action step uh, and there needs to be accountability around that, which is generally doesn't happen, uh, in part because our feedback sessions are often one-off and you, if you happen to see the, the learner again a week later or even two days later, you may, have, you may forget about what you had decided on and not ask. Um, needs to be both written and verbal. And it turns out in the written space that the narrative comments are really important, much more so than the quantitative scores for, for learning. Quantitative scores are important for summative judgments, but for, for learning. And then this whole idea of safe interpersonal space, um, I mean, this makes a lot of sense to us, right? We, we as psychiatrists, appreciate the role of the therapeutic alliance in creating a safe place uh, for, for the clinical care. Well, it turns out, Feedback's no different. You need an educational alliance. Um, and in it, we're th looking now at really shifting more from these models of information transfer to really a conversation that's bi-directional and is situated in a, in a relationship that's longitudinal um, and, um, and supportive. So uh, here's an example of a work-based assessment tool that we've developed in psychiatry for one of our EPAs. And we started on this before I even knew what an EPA was. This goes back to 12 years and at a time when there was no competency-based assessment tool in psychiatry for anything, um, um, including medication management. So we developed the PSCO. Um, and uh, this is a, a tool aimed to promote growth and assess competence with uh, medication management has 27 items, uh, so we have a checklist that we went through a, an expert process of identifying what are the essential tasks of a, of a med visit. A scale um, that started off done, not done, but in our pilot testing, faculty really wanted the NA because a lot of tasks that are essential aren't always applicable for every visit. Um, and our faculty really wanted a way of differentiating between uh, done, done with suggestions for improvement done really well. Um, and so we, we changed the scale, and then we have a space for uh, narrative comments. Um, and I have, a whole, I have a whole program of research that I pursued around this. And in you know, medical education, we've adopted the unitary model of validity, which uh, understands validity in terms of multiple dimensions. Um, and I won't get into that right here, but say I'm, I'm going to present some data on internal structure and correlation. Uh, and there's other data we have around content, validity, response process, and, and consequences. So the data set that I'm going to just briefly summarize for you today is from a four-year implementation at, in a third-year outpatient med clinic, so uh, at UCSF. So each residence in the clinic, a half day a week. There's four residents, two faculty. Um, over the four years, we got 601 completed observations. So this is a pretty big end for education uh, research. Um, and we, on average, we had 64 residents over the four years, 11 different faculty, uh, and on average about nine observations per resident per year. Our goal was eight, thinking that that was sort of a, a minimum threshold to be able to generalize. So uh, in terms of internal structure, so uh, we, a factor analysis um, that we did yielded three factors or three underlying constructs. We expected the first two. So AT is affective tasks, CT is cognitive tasks. So AT are those uh, tasks related to the interpersonal uh, interaction, affect in the room, um, such as uh, establishing rapport, conveying hope. The cognitive tasks are sort of the more technical tasks of information gathering, assessment, treatment planning. And then uh, HT is hard tasks. So this is a surprise factor. Um, 
And we called it hard tasks because these were tasks that residents, even at the end of their ambulatory psychopharm training, were not consistently uh, performing. Our, our factor analysis from a validity standpoint was encouraging in that we had uh, good uh, 0.5 in terms of proportion of variance, which is good for this kind of um, tool and instrument study, and 0.9 uh, Cronbach's alpha, so good internal uh, consistency. We then we mapped the factor scores uh, uh, over time to, with, the, with the assumption that they should improve um, with experience. So in this case, we're showing the proportion of trainees that have low mean scores, so we would expect this to go down. And in fact, for all three factors, they did go down. We also did some uh, more sophisticated uh, regression analyses that um, supported the same finding. What you can see here, though, for HT hard tasks is 30 percent of the trainees are still not uh, performing consistently at the end of their training. So, you know, lessons from this, uh, evidence for feasibility for direct observation in a busy clinic, uh, the underlying constructs and factor scores sort of behaved more or less as we predicted and support the validity of the instrument. And the hard tasks really raise a curricular uh, uh, questions for us around if this is generalizable, in other, if this same phenomenon is true in other programs, we may be graduating psychiatrists who really don't attend to a set of tasks that are critical uh, mediators of response. Okay. Second study on this, final study, is narrative comments. So how good are the comments being generated by this observation tool? What are the themes and how do the scores relate to the comments? A lot of study in medical education has been on end rotation evaluations or multi-source. Nothing has really looked yet uh, at direct observation tools and the quality of the comments that they generate. Um, we sampled 25% of the completed PSCOs. We then coded them on three axes. So valence, is it corrective or reinforcing? Um, um, specificity, is it specific and actionable or general? So like, you know, best resident in 30 years, that would be general. Uh, um, and then content, like what's the actual competency or, th or theme that's being commented on? Each PSCO on average had five comments three uh, reinforcing, two corrective, 95% were specific and actionable, and you had a 60% reinforcing, 40% corrective. This is really encouraging. If you look at uh, end rotation evaluations, they tend to be at best 40, 50% specific and often largely reinforcing. I, I don't know what your experience is here, but um, uh, studies uh, other institutions. So very encouraged by this. Eight primary themes that were identified. Um, uh, I won't um, spend time on this right now, but just to say that they were all uh, meaningful uh, themes that really rich uh, feedback that was being given. And this gives you an example of some of the, the, the uh, comments. So under uh, assesses is like, you know, assesses adverse effects or response, uses scales. Um, one reinforcing comment was excellent. How followed up on passive positive SI the patient had expressed at last visit. Um, uh, on the corrective side, suicidality, ask what means by not yet. Granted, patient said it in a lighthearted manner. Or adherence can ask, how many doses missed rather than have you missed? So this is really specific. Um, types of guidance that's, that's getting generated uh, by the PSCO. And then the final thing we looked at is, how do the checklist scores relate to the, to the comments? Uh, and this is something, again, that has been looked at in end rotation evaluations, but not so much in direct observation tools. And here we, we found that if a, if a trainee got marked low or high on the checklist score, two-thirds of the time there was a comment expanding on that and providing an explanation for what about it was good or what needed to be improved. On the other hand, for the comments, for the, which were almost all either corrective or reinforcing, only half the time was a comment accompanied by uh, a corresponding checklist score. So this gives us some insight into the role of the comments. The comments are providing uh, essential amplification of checklist scores so that the learner knows what to continue or what to change. Um, 
but it also is adding unique feedback that's not actually conveyed uh, by the um, by the checklist. And um, the the comments actually helped us identify two constructs that we think aren't adequately captured in the in the checklist, which is engaging patients or the shared decision making. And uh, time management, which is interesting. Uh, we didn't really have that explicit uh, in, in our checklist. So, um, you know, this really supports overall is one of the first studies to show that actually these direct observation tools can generate uh, high quality feedback. All right, so lessons from all of this um, implementation wise, uh, set your bar high. Um, because uh, when we started off, we said, okay, we don't want to overburden faculty. We'll do one per month. But the problem with that is it's not a habit, and then you forget, and it never happens. So then we, when we made it, uh, every clinic that you supervise in, you do it at least once, uh, is remarkable. Actually, the, you know, the, we did much better against that standard than the one per month standard. Um, culture change, a real big change in the role of faculty from more you know, uh, asynchronous case guidance um, to being in there, you know, coaching and observing and giving feedback. And, you know, there definitely we had resistance initially, but um, once uh, folks got into this, they most faculties loved it. And really, they felt like they have a much better sense of what's going on with the patients and a better sense of what their learners are, are struggling with. Um, we've talked about how it improved feedback. The other big thing when you start to do this is you realize what you're not teaching well. And so in our case, we realize, wow, you know, at least in our setting, our residents don't know how to assess for adherence, monitor adverse effects, aren't really screening well for substance misuse. Um, and so we then developed um, you know, some supporting uh, workshops uh, for those skills. All right, so um, I'm going to just finish here by uh, referencing that now we're putting this on an app. And uh, this is really exciting, uh, where it's a single entrustment scale. So it's on your phone. Uh, faculty, you're doing this here, I think, in UME. It's, uh, you open it up. You choose the resident. You choose the EPA. You only, no checklist. You just choose the um, level of supervision that the resident needs based on that um, observation. And then one comment. Uh, you s tap Submit. It gets emailed simultaneously to all parties and, uh, and then uploaded to a run chart that so shows uh, progress over time. And if you hover over any data point, it shows the comment attached to that. And this um, is, uh, takes 72 seconds on average to, to complete in our pilot study. Um, and about 65 characters is the average comment, so much shorter uh, comments. But from a quality standpoint, high quality, very specific uh, behaviorally. Um, faculty prefer it, um, and you know, the the issue is really around uh, issues of now thinking about this paper piece go with the checklist, iPhone, um, more just a global evaluation. Is thinking through, is there a role for both, or should we just go to the iPhone and forget the uh, paper? And I think there's some questions here about really what's the role of the checklist. And there is some evidence that it helps develop shared mental model between faculty in terms of what are the essential tasks. Um, there's also some evidence that um, faculty observe differently when they're using a checklist. Um, and, you know, we'll have to, this is, we'll have to look at this more, but there may be a role for both. Um, Big area of research is how do residents assign credibility to feedback uh, when, because there's a lot of feedback that turns out residents just um, dismiss, right? And so uh, patient feedback is, is number one. Uh, feedback from peers is given uh, quite a bit of valence. And feedback from faculty is really mixed. Uh, and so understanding, like, what are the features of a feedback from faculty that actually uh, are um, helpful and sort of adopted or engaged with by the trainee. Early studies suggest that it goes back to what we were saying early, uh, a minute ago, which is uh, the type of relationship it's situated in, uh, the perception that the motive is to support, and that it's meaningful uh, feedback. All right, so final on all of this is um, 
which you won't, we're not going to have time to talk about, but faculty development is key. Um, we, faculty need to be trained on how to observe. Uh, they need to be trained on the performance dimensions and frames of reference. Otherwise, we're not going to be assessing the same thing. Uh, and they need to be trained on how to apply the scale. So even if you agree on what constitutes med visit, um, um, how are you applying the standard? Uh, and this needs to be done repetitively over time. If you do it once, nine months later, there's, there's back to idiosyncratic, poor inter-rater reliability. Narrative feedback turns out, though not with the PSCO, but in a lot of narrative feedback uh, tends to be vague and hard to decipher. And, and you know, Schiffer Ginsburg has done amazing research at the Wilson Center, University of Toronto, showing using politeness theory and showing how it's actually intentionally vague. And um, it is actually hard often for residents to understand what's really being said. So um, probably don't want to get rid of politeness, but um, need to train folks on really how, how to write um, specific and, and valuable feedback. Verbal, more of the conversation, and the biggest threat is trivialization. So if this just becomes part pro forma, something we do, um, and it'll lose really all value. And so that's a lot of discussion right now, and how do you keep this meaningful? Um, and that's, uh, that's it. So uh, misalignment, what, how, why, redesigning, and then sort of this idea of EPAs and work-based assessment. Thank you. Yes. Hi, good morning. And, uh, I'm, uh, I'm director for Child and Adolescent uh, Fellowship here at the U. And so this is a very timely and relevant topic for us because we're going to do our milestones here this afternoon. And so my question is, we are struggling a little bit with the milestones, and we, in fact, had in this, uh, this morning the conversations about whether we have to switch to EPAs. And this being a specialty, have you actually looked at how much, how they would differ? Uh, do we have, do you have to do more work based on your model uh, that you have something ready uh, for the adult psychiatry program? But if we were to adapt it to child psychiatry where development and all those aspects become important, do we have to make a lot of changes uh, for that to become adaptable to the to that uh, specialty. To child? Correct. Yes, I think so. I think you probably have to, um, you don't necessarily have to do what we did, but I think you have to go through the process of what are the, uh, what are the EPAs that are really specific to child and adolescent fellowship. Um, you hopefully are, are able to assume that folks entering fellowship ideally have accomplished the end of training general, although not always the case. And I guess right. this raises a question of fast tracking and, and this notion that we count, you know, one of the years. So, yeah, I think there's, um, there's enough, there's a number of variables there that I think you have to think through. Right. Because for, uh, that is what we ran into this morning saying a first year CAP fellow when they enters, what should be their baseline and where do we start? I think there's not even agreement among our staff or faculty about where should they start yeah. and how we are scoring them. So I want to ask you your reflections about how you went about that faculty development because this is the first year we've actually tried the dashboard with Dr. Michael Cullen and we are doing the pilot project yeah. uh, for the CAP fellowship. And so can you reflect a little bit upon how the faculty development process was and how long you took for your faculty to get onto the same page about the anchors and about how you score and uh, some, yeah. Yeah, um, Michael Cullen's amazing. He is. Uh, you're, he's a real uh, leader nationally and uh, we're big admirers of his work. Um, um, so, I, you know, the, there's faculty development for direct observation and feedback, and then there's faculty develop, there's development for the coaches, and those are probably different people. And then there's a the development for the CCC. So there's like, those are, there's, those are really three big buckets that have to be attended to. Um, I am, in terms of for the feedback, uh, um, really, we have a model that we use. I teach in the, competency-based assessment course that the ACGME offers the program directors nationally, and we do um, 
we we have a, a really nice approach to that. I think that's quite effective where um, we actually do an, an, an OSTE, uh, six stations where you go through performance dimension training, frame of reference, and then you watch a, a standardized resident do something, and then you give feedback, and you get feedback on your feedback. And um, But I think, you know, you, those sorts of things, uh, the other classic approach is to put up a video, watch it together, and then score it together. Um, I think those are, are, you know, mixing it up, but I think you have to do it over time, and it's not just one-off. But we've the, the one-off trainings of faculty help for a couple months, but then uh, those reversions so to our idiosyncratic. So it's it's like learning; it needs to be con rep repeated over time. Um, the coaching using the dashboards is more in our setting is what the coaches, not so much the faculty doing direct observation, but it's the the coaches and the CCCs, and that that is a different skill set. Um, you know, we're, and I wouldn't say, I don't think we figured that out, but, um, you know, there's a lot of literature emerging on coaching, and um, we're about to develop uh, a coaching program, and maybe we could share notes. I mean, I don't really, we know it's important. Um, we, we use a lot of Joan Sargent's work uh, around R2C2, which is kind of a, probably the, the um, one of the models that, it's got the most traction and sort of research base to it. Um, is that helpful? Get there um, because um, we, we just uh, we haven't done any development, faculty development with our CCC, but that's our next step. But I think it's a good start for us to know. Yeah, uh, and then to realize that there are some resources out there. Yeah, I can send you some. I mean, the resources that uh, we, we're using in developing our coaching program. Uh, UCSF has a coaching program that they've rolled out in UME that um, is is pretty decent. Um, so there, there are some models out there. But I think the important thing is that coaching is different from, feed, from the uh, observation feedback. So, I mean, you, you captured something very appropriate. When we were crafting the milestones, we really struggled with how to get granular enough without too, without too much. And, and I'm not surprised to hear that that's continuing to be reflected in their use. One of the things... I'm thinking about that we struggle with that seems like we're going to continue to have a problem with with EPAs is what could be called the weird stuff. Yeah. Neuro, and specifically neuro, neuroscience and sort of, and where does the role of diagnostic testing, neuroimaging, genetics, the emerging neuromodulation therapies, the things that most residents are probably not going to see or use a lot during their training and yet over the 20 years of their practice, they'd better be able to figure out how to, how, we could, with the milestones, we ended up just sort of punting and saying no something and how to refer. Is there any thought about how in the EPAs we handle those sort of rare but essential for future growth kind of activities? Yeah. Um, so I, one thing that we did is we thought, we talked about kind of core EPAs and aspirational EPAs. So, um, so I think there are EPAs that aren't yet in certain settings, maybe you could have, but aren't aren't yet ready as a, a, to be required because there's just not enough there for it. Um, but for your the other response I would make is I, I don't think EPA actually captures everything. So I think you're going to need there's certain types like practice based learning and improvement probably isn't an EPA and yet it's critical. You know, it undergirds all these units of activity is sort of this idea of self-assessment and incorporating data and all of that. So, you know, a lot of us think that that probably is something you need to, to have a drive and, and have people learn and needs to be uh, assessed, but may not be best. You may need something other than an APA framework to get at. Um, and that may be true for, you know, neuroscience if, if, um, you've decided as a program, like as we have, that you really want your graduating residents to have some familiarity with kind of some of the basic frameworks and, you know, brain and cells and receptors and networks and all that. Even if it's not being used in day-to-day -day clinical, um, 
I think that's that's an important value, and then you need to, you know, obviously structure that in the curriculum, but you're going to have to assess it with something other than EPAs. So I, my answer to that is I think EPAs is incredibly useful for for those units of activities that we do in clinic, but um, it doesn't necessarily cover, I don't think it covers everything. QI is another one that, you know, that's the 13th EPA for UMA, and we had one of ours, our last the one that performed the poorest still performed pretty well was QI. I'm, you know, a lot of us aren't. I mean, I'm a. It's a huge believer in this importance of that for physicians. But you know, how do you how you know, it, EPAs may not be the best framework to get at that. And what's the discrete unit of activity? I suppose you could define it as uh, doing a root cause or or something. Uh, but so that's be my answer. Yeah. <clears throat> Back in the 1990s, the board certification process changed from life forever, board certified, to being certified only for a period of 10 years. So my question has to do with after graduation and after this training we're, we're uh, uh, reinventing, I guess, at this point. Would you make some comments about the maintenance of cert certification now uh, required of most specialties? Um, well, I love the question, and my biggest comment would be that I think we everything we're talking about we want to do with residents, I think we should do an MOC, i.e., why aren't we observing each other as peers and giving each other feedback and using the EPAs, you know, as part of that? Um, so uh, I think there's a lot of potential for applying, actually, the EPA framework to uh, CME and sort of the, the whole, uh, what do you call it, the uh, F... PPE or OPPE, and but um, th so I yes, I think I think there's a lot of applicability there. Um, you know, MOC started off. Um, it's there we're really kind of withdrawing, right? We started off with all these different requirements, and now it's kind of they're making it simpler, and it's back to the test. Uh, and you know, we know that the test is, um, I, you know, is uh, really has probably limited value. We're piloting now, I don't know if this is ABMS wide, I think it is, but this whole idea where you don't take the test, but you do the X number of uh, questions every year, and that, that's more consistent with how people learn. Um, but I think, you know, we got to get to what we do in, with patients. That's got to become part of it. Uh, at Kaiser, you get feedback, you get your patient evaluations, and um they take that really seriously, and um, and if you don't perform well on that, you get coached, and you get really good coaching. Um, so there's that's a, another model using multi-source feedback, but sort of you know coworkers uh, and patients. But you know, I think direct observation is uh, key. Is anyone using um, patient feedback with trainees? Yes, um, I think the, um, like, you know, I, I, do you guys do that yet? A limited amount in clinic, yeah. Yeah. We, yeah, the Press Ganey surveys are collected on the resident's care. The challenge we have right now is um, we're not able to capture Press Ganey at the resident level, and we have to administer our own uh, we have patients in the resident clinic complete twice a year for like a week. Every patient that comes in completes it. It's on paper and it's uh, it's kind of it's not very, it's very low yield. But um, if we, um, I think that uh, yes, we should we sh we need to figure that out um, and uh, and capture that both for we don't do that for attendings very well actually. So my other question. Um I was sort of, because I think you, I think the study with, was it Pisco? I can't remember. Pisco, Pisco yeah. Um, was starting up when I was there. Yeah. Um, I remember people talking about it. And, you know, the, the, the data are impressive. Um, and the, and the, particularly the, the ability to give very specific um, feedback, including narrative feedback, is very impressive. And I guess, my guess can only be valuable um, to the residents. Do you have any kind of, um, either quantitative or qualitative feedback from the residents on the process. That's question number one. 
And then question number two, that I was curious why, given the richness of, of that particular instrument, if I was following you correctly, this current instrument you're looking at, the app-based instrument, is so um, nonspecific. Yeah. Is, is that, did I get it right, that you're sort of picking a moment in time and giving feedback to a learner about something you've observed, rating it on where you think they are in the level of independence or entrustable action? Yeah. It could be any number of things. Well, it's um, so both are based on observing a specific visit, resident with patient. Um, one is the checklist is has all those behaviors. The app is just a single level of observation, so it's a global assessment. I noticed today you didn't give information about SSRI. Yes, effects. yeah. So you'll rate them somewhere on that scale of independence, and then you'll give the specific feedback about yeah. what you observed. Yeah, what they could do better to get to yeah. the next level. Yeah. What you end up getting is you get probably comparable quality comment, but it's it, you're getting one comment, and maybe with a little bit less uh, context and narrative to it. So what, what we don't know... We don't, so the answer is we don't know, like, how, what's more helpful to the learner. Is it sort of getting five comments with quite some more context to it and with thickness, and, uh, and with, like, three of which are positive and two are corrective, or is it more helpful or equally helpful just to get a single kind of straight up, this is something to, to work on? Um, Any qualitative feedback from residents? Yeah, we're, so... Not yet. I'm, we're finishing actually a using a cons consolidated framework for implementation research. We're actually interviewing faculty and residents and their experience um, with it. Um, and I haven't seen the resident data yet. Faculty um, prefer the app because it's quicker and easier. However, they say that the checklist actually helps them um, Actually, they feel like it helps them with their own practice because it reminds them to do things uh, that they don't do. And if they're going to be evaluating the resident on it, you know, there's sort of this internal like accountability. Well, I can't be dinging the resident if I don't do it. That would be my concern with the app is that you're only going to see the errors that you yourself happen to think are yeah. egregious errors. Yes. And you're not going to see the things that you don't do. Yes. Yet, which are part of good practice. I think that's spot on. So what we. I suspect, you know, that maybe the solution is it's both. So you train faculty with the checklist and you work and they continue to use that some of the time to, so that we're aligned around the same mental model. But um, there's also spaces where you maybe use the app, which is quicker and kind of faster and, and all that. I just have one um, last thing and then we're near the end of our time, but uh, kind of um, building off of of this discussion here, uh, while I'm not a proponent of the vague, polite feedback, which we have copious amounts in Minnesota, because that's kind of our usual communication style, I do worry that with some of the frequent data points and the frequent evaluations, you start to get data that is often skewed by sometimes implicit biases uh, of, of the evaluator, and then you can sometimes get some sort of discriminatory, discriminatory drift towards um, trainees that are less like or different from, from the evaluator. And I wonder how um, you've approached this or thought about this. Yeah, I think it's a, um, I think it's a really critical issue. It goes to, um, I mean, really, it's a type of validity. Um, bias, you know, uh, compromises that and can be a way of othering, I guess, is uh, what you're suggesting. Um, um, I mean, I, I guess I don't know if I have any, you know, my thoughts on that is that's why the frame of reference and performance dimension, particularly frame of reference training, is so important because you need to do a lot of compare and contrast the surface assumptions that faculty are making that aren't often um, actually, once they're articulated and brought out, you realize, oh, that's actually probably not true. Um, Form of developing precision prior to launching it. So, so, so we don't we don't just launch this without some very specific training. Yeah. So, like the the frame of reference training we do, we um, we focus, we listen. Those of us who are leading it in the small groups, we're listening and challenging assumptions, and that's really our role. Well, how do you know the resident doesn't care? 
Well, because they were looking down at their phone. They were totally dissing this, this faculty member. Well, you know, well, that's one possible explanation, but there are others, right? Uh, and so, like, drilling in on that, and that is, that's really important work in sort of uncovering, because we bring all these assumptions in, in biases and, and then make judgments. Um, so I, I think that's, um, it's hard work, though, because, you know, we, um, it's hard to change bias, um, uh, you know, the heuristics, uh, how our brains work. But in any event, that's why frame of reference is so important. It's helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thanks. You have been disconnected from the meeting.